Welcome to the Viva Vegan Podcast with me, Faye. And me, Lex. I'm pretty excited to get to introduce Dr. Melanie Joy. She's the world's leading expert on the psychology of eating animals, most notable for introducing the term carnism. Now, essentially, carnism describes the inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes people have towards eating animals, and it's often referred to as the opposite of veganism. She's written several award-winning books on the topic and how it impacts relationships between vegans and non-vegans, as well as social transformation. And that includes the best-selling Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, Beyond Beliefs, a guide to improving relationships and communication for vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters, and getting relationships right. Her international organization, Beyond Carnism, is dedicated to exposing and transforming carnism and is home to the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy. In this episode, I get to ask Melanie more about her work to create a unified and resilient vegan movement, how we can learn to recognize secondary trauma, and what we need to do to improve our communication. Hi, Melanie. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Viva Vegan podcast. I've been really keen to talk more about your work ever since reading some of your books and seeing you speak at Vegan Camp Out a few years ago. So, yeah, thank you for taking the time out today to join us. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation. I think the work you guys do is just fantastic and I'm, I'm honored to be talking with you. So thank you. So your groundbreaking book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, is about the belief system and psychology of meat eating. And whilst reading it, I think for me, there was a lot of real, oh yeah, moments in it. But what was it that led you to write the book and how difficult was it to come up with such an attention grabbing title? Uh, well, actually, the title was originally the subtitle of the book. Uh, way back when, when I wrote the first iteration of this book, it was called Carnism. And then the subtitle was Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. And my agent was like, flip it. And um, it be, we weren't getting any hits, you know, and then flip it. And then all, all of a sudden, people started responding and we got a publisher. So um, the book really, it grew out of my own life, my own experience, my own desire to understand why we love dogs, eat pigs and wear cows and to help other people understand that too. And, mm -hmm. you know, really, I, I like many people, I, I grew up, of course, with a dog who I, I loved, you know, and I also grew up eating meat, eggs and dairy. And I was always a person who cared about animals and would never have wanted to contribute to their suffering, you know, especially when that suffering was like so intensive and so completely unnecessary. But, you know, for so much of my life, just for years, I, you know, never thought about how strange it was that I could pet my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other, you know, a pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sentient as my dog. I just, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't connect the dots, right, between the meat or eggs or dairy on my plate and the living being it once was. Um, but all that changed in 1989. Um, I was 23 years old and I ate a hamburger that was uh, contaminated with Campylobacter and I got really, really sick and I wound up in the hospital on intravenous antibiotics. Um, wow. And I like became a vegetarian by accident basically because, you know, like when the last thing you eat makes you so sick, you never want to eat it again. And it's <laughs> yeah. not like, right. I was just like, oh my God, I'm never eating meat again. <laughs> And so I kind of, I was like, okay, now I've got to learn how to like cook for myself and how to shop for myself. And this was like, of course, was the eighties. So it was a whole different, you know, whole <laughs> yeah. different experience. And so in the process of, of, of learning, you know, how to be a vegetarian and then I, I became vegan shortly thereafter, you know, I uh, stumbled upon information about animal agriculture and, you know, what I learned just shocked and horrified me. I, I, I couldn't believe the extent of the suffering of, you know, and harm to non-human animals, the environment. They didn't even know back then what they know now, yeah. you know, and also to human health. But what shocked me in some ways even more was that like nobody I talked to was willing to hear what I had to say. You know, this wall would just go up. It'd be like, mm -hmm. okay, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal. Or they'd call me a radical vegan hippie propagandist. And, you know, these were like my friends and family. They were people who were rational. They were people who were very justice minded, very, you know, they all cared about animals, you know, and yet it was sort of like, they would just stop thinking and feeling when it came to this issue of eating animals. And like mm -hmm. nothing I said could get through to them. I mean, so Why We Love Dogs is actually the book I wanted everybody in my life to read so they would get it. Um, yeah. But I ended up writing it because I just became really curious how, you know, 
people who are rational and caring, like myself, you know, like I had been my whole life, could really just be so like sort of willfully oblivious, you know, or ignorant to the the issue of animal agriculture and eating animals. And so I ended up enrolling in a doctoral program in psychology and I studied the psychology of violence and nonviolence broadly. Um, And I narrowed that down to really look at the psychology of, of eating animals for my doctoral dissertation. And that was what led me to identify what I came to call carnism, the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. And I I didn't want to, and, and then I, I ended up writing that into, the, you know, Why We Love Dogs. Um, mm-hmm. you know, that was my dissertation. I turned it into Why We Love Dogs and rewrote it. But I, I didn't want to write another book on why people shouldn't eat animals, like, because the facts are out there, you know? Yeah. It was like, well, why aren't the facts selling, you know, selling the ideology? Like, people hear the facts. They see the graphic imagery, you know, and the next day they're still at the McDonald's drive through So I didn't want to talk about why people shouldn't eat animals, but really like why people do eat animals in the first place. Like why do well-intentioned people support uh, a, a, a practice that's really runs completely counter to their core values and really how they want to move through the world and be in the world. Yeah. And coining a new term to describe this as an ideology then is quite a big deal. And I'm interested in hearing how that came about. But can you start by just telling us exactly what is carnism? It's it's quite a unique idea, I suppose, revolutionary, in fact. So what is carnism and how does it impact relationships between vegans and non-vegans? Well, so carnism is the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. And when I was doing my doctoral research, you know, I interviewed vegans and vegetarians, meat eaters, meat cutters, butchers, people who had raised and killed their own animals for food. I was really looking at the psychology of, you know, the psychology of eating animals, essentially. Um, And, you know, what I found was that everybody had the same experience eating or killing or butchering animals and vegans and vegetarians experience the same thing before they became vegan or vegetarian, which is basically that they go through these mental gymnastics in order to disconnect from the truth of their experience when it comes to causing harm to animals. I mean, that's in in a nutshell. So, Mm -hmm. you know, what I recognized was that, like, there's more going on than just individuals, you know, unique psychology. Everybody's having the same experience. And the only way this sort of like widespread um, contradictory attitudes and behaviors toward animals are possible to exist, right? People care about animals and yet they harm them and find ways to not be really aware of the harm that they're supporting or, or participating in. You know, the only way these widespread like contradictory attitudes and behaviors exist is within a widespread ideology or belief system. We've all like just been conditioned. So carnism is a, it's essentially the opposite of veganism, right? We Mm -hmm. tend to assume that only vegans or maybe vegetarians follow a belief system, but the only reason people might eat pigs, but not dogs, for example, is because, you know, they do follow a belief system when it comes to eating animals. So when eating animals is, is not a necessity for survival, you know, which is true for, for many people in the day, people today, um, who, people who can make their food choices freely, essentially, then it's a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. And I felt it was incredibly important to name carnism because it takes eating animals out of the personal choice realm. Like eating animals is not simply a matter of like personal choice or personal preference. It's the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive system that profoundly conditions people from the minute we're weaned, we're being conditioned to think and feel and act in a certain way. We're basically on autopilot uh, when it comes to eating animals. And I think, you know, we really need to understand that that that's true. So people can free their minds essentially from carnism and, uh, and by really deconstructing the system and, and you know, meaning breaking it down and, and, and highlighting for people, explaining what it is that's happening psychologically that keeps people, you know, kind of stuck in this mindset of carnism, it helps free people from that. And this is important for non-vegans to understand, because when you understand basically the way your mind's been hijacked, you can think more freely and make your food choices more mm-hmm. freely. 
And it's important for vegans to understand because so many vegans, like you probably experience this, you know, all you have to do is say I'm vegan and then the wall goes up. Absolutely. And that's it. Yeah. You know, because what, what carnism does is it, it, it distorts people's perceptions. And I can talk about that a little bit more. And it, it conditions people to be defensive, to feel defensive against anyone or anything that would help them get out of the carnistic box. And that often means vegans. So vegans can be in a relationship, you know, with non-vegans or talking to non-vegans and, and find that this, this wall immediately goes up. There are all these stereotypes that the non-vegan has about the vegan that suddenly, you know, start yeah. creating problems and disconnections. And it f- can feel impossible to have a healthy, connected relationship or even conversation in such a situation. Evergreen Insurance Services proudly partner with Viva. Arrange your next insurance policy through us and we'll donate up to 25% of our income back to Viva. For the animals, for health, for the environment. Find us on socials or visit our website at evergreeninsuranceservices.co.uk or call us on 020 3372 2160. Make a different choice. Make it evergreen. And you've said that there's three ends of justification. And what are those three ends? Well, when in the, my book, um, you know, and on our website at carnism.org, we have a lot of information for people, for people who are interested to learn more. But in, in my, um, you know, talking about carnism, um, you know, what I what I discovered is that car, because carnism, carnism runs counter to, to most people's core values, right? Most people, um, you know, would never willingly support harm to animals in such a way. Um, it needs to use these psychological defense mechanisms. And these defense mechanisms basically su- dis distort our perceptions and disconnect us from our authentic feelings when it comes to farmed animals, eating animals, you know, vegans, a whole host of things. And so um, these defenses manifest in various ways. And one defense that I talk about is, you know, what you said, the three ends of justification. We, We learn to justify eating animals by learning to believe that the myths of eating animals are the facts of eating animals. You know, we've inherited this huge mythology about eating animals. Um, And we don't question that we we don't recognize that these are myths, you know? And so the three ends of justification are eating the beliefs essentially that, or the myths that eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. You know, the same arguments that have been used to justify violent practices throughout human history from male dominance to heterosexual supremacy. And these myths are institutionalized, right? They're embraced and maintained by all the major social institutions. So medicine, you know, nutrition, business, you know, they, they all, all these institutions like perpetuate these myths. People don't realize that, you know, this carnistic bias is built right into society. So when we study nutrition, for example, we actually study uh, carnistic nutrition. And this makes it very tricky for vegans who are trying to have an open conversation about veganism and raise awareness, and for vegans who are in relationships with non-vegans and trying to find a way to, to, to have healthy conversations and stay connected. Yeah, yeah. And so I think effective communication then is one of the key themes that runs through a lot of your books as well and something that you have a big interest in talking about. So, and and we're talking about effective communication between vegans and non-vegans, but what's your one top tip? And I know this might be quite difficult just to give one. What's your top tip for any vegan wanting to improve their communication with a meat eater? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, I'll I'll share an attitudinal change and then a tip, right? Because it, 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 you know, it starts with an attitude. It's important to like sort of recognize the attitudes that can get in the way of effective communication, even when you have the strategies. So, you know, one of the things that I, I recommend for vegans is, um, to, if you're in a relationship with a non-vegan to recognize that that relationship is probably what's called triangulated. It's a a relationship between three, not just two. It's not, it's you, the non-vegan and carnism. Right. And very often vegans and non-vegans are, you know, butting heads and arguing with each other when they don't recognize that the real problem is this third entity in the relationship, which is carnism. And so I think it's it's very, very important. And I write about this in, in my book, Beyond Beliefs, to to not see non-vegans as opponents, but to really understand that they have been psychologically profoundly affected by carnism and it causes defensiveness. This is not an excuse, but it's an explanation because it makes you less likely to engage with those defenses and get into this battle of defenses and to recognize that like underneath your differences, uh, carnism and veganism is a relationship between people. And that's really where the focus needs to be. 
Um, so effective communication is life changing for anybody. Like most people never learn effective communication and most people really struggle to navigate relationships effectively, period. And, you know, but then when you layer onto that, you know, this major sort of ideological difference, carnism and veganism, things can get very difficult. So, you know, very often, like all communication has two parts to it, the, the process or the content and the process. The content is what we're talking about, right? It's the subject or the topic of the communication. The process is how we're talking or how we're communicating. The process matters more, but most people overfocus on the content. They focus on like, oh my God, if I could just get the right stats to share with this person, if I can just get the right words, you know, everything will be yeah. fine. The content is the what and the process is the how. Like if you and the process matters more, but we tend to overfocus on the content. So if you think, for example, about a conversation you had like maybe six months ago at a party you were at, there's a good chance that you don't even remember the content at all, mm -hmm. but you probably still remember how you felt in that conversation. Yeah. The process determines how you feel. So when our process is healthy, what that means is that our goal is not to win which means to make the other person lose. That's the debate model. And the debate model has been shown to be counterproductive in a large number of situations. Um, mm -hmm. Our goal is not to be right, which means to make the other person wrong. Our goal is mutual understanding. Yeah. The only reason we communicate is because we're not mind readers. So, you know, the goal of a communication is to help the other person understand your thoughts and feelings and maybe needs and to understand their thoughts and feelings and maybe needs. So when your process is healthy, you can talk about pretty much anything without arguing. And when your process is not healthy, you can't talk about anything without <laughs> arguing. And so a healthy process has as its goal, mutual understanding. It's connection. Yeah. It, in in um, some of my more recent writing, I, I talk about what I call the formula for healthy relating. And this really informs any process, right? A process mm -hmm. of communication, a process of any interaction or relationship. So in a healthy interaction, communication, relationship, whatever, you know, any interaction, whether between a human and another human or a human and a non-human or social groups, it's all the same. Yeah. The formula is this. You practice integrity and honor dignity. And that is the formula for healthy relating. And that means healthy communicating. So mm -hmm. when you practice integrity, it means you practice compassion and fairness. You, you practice respect. You treat the other person the way you would want to be treated if you were in their position. Yeah. And when you honor dignity, that means you think of the other person, the other individual as no less worthy of being treated with respect and of occupying space on this planet than anybody else. So when we practice integrity and honor dignity, this results in feeling more connected and more secure. Mm -hmm. And you can, and this is what a healthy process is based on. It doesn't matter who you're relating to. It doesn't matter what you're talking about or what you're doing. This is the recipe for a healthy process. And you can come back to this formula at any moment in your life and in a relationship and come back to work on practicing it. And it applies to how we relate to ourselves as well. Yeah, yeah. And so moving on just to talk about the world of animal advocacy, burnout seems to be quite common and symptoms of secondary trauma are pretty widespread. Can you explain what secondary traumatic stress is and how people or activists can start to recognize some of the warning signs? Sure. Yeah. So secondary traumatic stress is the same as post-traumatic stress. Most people have probably heard of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Secondary traumatic stress can be D disorder. It doesn't have to be. It's exactly the same as PTSD, except for one difference. PTSD affects the direct victims of violence. Secondary traumatic stress affects the witnesses to violence. Yeah. Many, many vegans have been witness to violence, you know, just being vegan, being awake to the atrocity that is carnism, you know, can be very traumatizing and, um, you know, and can develop the symptoms, symptoms of trauma. And, uh, you know, there's a whole list of symptoms and I'll share a few of them with mm -hmm. you. Um, feeling um, what's, well, one thing is called emotional lability, which is mean, means that your emotions are, you, you feel too much or you don't feel enough. Your emotions change dramatically, you know, or, um, 
you know, you could feel too much, you could feel not enough, or you can swing between the extremes, um, feeling guilty for feeling good, feeling like your efforts are never enough, um, developing, you know, more and more misanthropy or, you know, f frustration or anger at humanity. Um, and dysregulation is very common. When you're dysregulated, that means that you're out of balance. It's, it's emotional dysregulation. You're emotionally out of balance. So you can be, you know, you get triggered very easily. Um, you can be very reactive, you know, just feel, you know, chronically uptight or flat. Um, and um, we also develop uh, what's called, a, we can develop what I call a trauma narrative. Mm -hmm. It's a way of thinking and seeing the world where we start to put everybody, including ourselves, into one of three roles, either victim, perpetrator, or hero. Yeah. We lose the capacity for any nuance in how we think about uh, you know, the roles that people can play in a trauma or individuals can play in a trauma. We can start holding ourselves and others to impossible standards. And so it's really, it's hard to simplify something like this you know, for people because there's, there's a lot of information. It, it would be incredibly, I think it can be incredibly empowering for vegans to recognize what secondary traumatic stress is. We have yeah. a lot of resources, you know, veganadvocacy.org, and work to prevent yourself from developing it. If you have it, work to help mitigate and heal that. Um, and, and because we have a high rates of trauma in this movement, and we need to like really work on that. Yeah, and I think the two most common that I often hear people talk about is the fact that they don't feel that they're doing enough and then this feeling guilty when you do something for yourself and taking time out of doing activism to look after yourself or have a self-care day, that kind of thing. People seem to feel really, really guilty about that. But how do you think that secondary trauma impacts vegans and their relationships? Well, um, I actually forgot to mention another very common symptom, which is intrusive thoughts. So you go about your day and suddenly you have these, they're like basically flashbacks to mm -hmm. the, the images of, of animals suffering. Um, and it, it affects relationships between, I mean, it affects vegans because of the things that we talk to about, you know, so the, the more burned out you, or the more, you know, traumatized you get, the more likely you're going to become embittered and highly reactive, the more likely you are to be chronically dysregulated. And when you're in a state of dysregulation, it doesn't take much to set you off, you know, yeah. and the more likely you are to see people who are not vegan as perpetrators and to feel like they're your opponents, you know, so for example, you go to this demo and, you know, you're surrounded by other angry vegans, you know, understandably morally outraged vegans and holding these horrible signs, you know, or horrible graphic signs. And, you know, then you come home to your partner who's like cooking steak and in your mind, you're like, you, you are the reason <laughs> that all those animals are dying. Yeah. And and it, I mean, it's true, the person who's eating animals is contributing to the system, but what can happen is secondary traumatic stress can make us exaggerate the impact of every individual and really limit, like you start seeing non-vegans, like not as individuals anymore, not as people who are, you know, fathers and, you know, sisters and teachers and whatever else, but the, everybody becomes the non-vegan. A non-vegan yeah. is a non-vegan and all non-vegans are the same. And so our relationships can be impacted in, in really profound ways. Um, when we become traumatized, it becomes really hard for us, as you said, to take care of ourselves. And usually a self-care day isn't enough. You know, it's really a change of lifestyle where yeah. we build in regular self-care because, you know, what tends to happen is when you become traumatized, you're less likely to engage in self-care. You're less likely to do the very things you need to do to get you know, to, to stop being traumatized. So for example, one of the most important things for people to do, vegans to do, is to stop witnessing. Stop taking in that graphic imagery. Stop watching those movies. You don't need to see them. But when you're traumatized, you feel guilty if you don't. And you yeah. can overconsume them, and then it makes you more reactive, and then you bring this home to your family, and you're more sensitive, and it's harder for you to talk to them. Um, you're less likely to be able to cultivate healthy relational connections because Trauma is very disconnecting and it's very non-relational. It, it, it breaks you, it makes it very hard for you to connect with other people and um, in a healthy way. And yet studies show that healthy relational connections are essential for healing trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know this might be, again, quite difficult for you to answer because people are so different and so varied in the way that they deal with secondary trauma. But do you have any advice on 
kind of suggested coping mechanisms that people could try or recommendations on how animal activists in particular can take better care of themselves and have longevity in the movement. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. First of all, getting informed is the is key. Like you got to know, I mean, the more you know about secondary trauma and what it looks like, how it manifests in your life, the better able you will be to recognize the symptoms as symptoms and not think, oh, this is just the way it is. This is just the way life is. Because secondary trauma generally doesn't develop overnight. You know, it comes over a long period of time of build of build up, right? And then these feelings and attitudes and behaviors become so normalized for us that we don't realize recognize them as problematic, you know? So getting informed is key. We have a lot of information on this. We have what's called the Secondary Traumatic uh, Trauma Inventory. It's a, a questionnaire you can fill out to find out, you know, it, to get a sense of like, you know, what your level of secondary trauma might be. I've adapted, you know, other ones for that are used for um, people who are witnesses to human suffering um, for, for vegan active or animal activists, right? So, so really getting informed, um, healing and community is, is so important. Um, it's, it's not something, you know, a lot of times vegans find just like one more reason to beat themselves up. Like now I can't even take care of myself, like putting self care on the to-do list. That's already too long. So it's, Building healthy relationships, and I would say building what I call relational literacy, which is the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating, is absolutely fundamental. The more you know how to relate to others in a way that is healthy, meaning that creates a sense of connection and security, the healthier you are going to be relationships. Healthy relationships are really healing. Um, one of my books, Getting Relationships Right, and I also write about this in Beyond Beliefs, is a it's a one-stop guide to building relational literacy. It's not rocket science. You know, there are principles and practices. Um, but, you know, you can think about this just in your own life, how differently you feel when there's somebody you know you're going to see who really gets you, who is like a good friend to you, who you can just kick back and be yourself with, you can laugh with, you can be seen with. And the feeling of like fortification you get from those connections is like un unparalleled. Yeah, brilliant. And moving on to talk a bit about climate activism then, with obviously we're in, right in the middle of the climate emergency. And recently you released a video exposing the psychology behind why climate advocates often don't want to talk about animal agriculture. But can you tell our listeners more about the video, why you made it and how viewers have reacted to it? Yeah. So, I mean, probably a lot of people who are listening to this, you know, are really well aware of the role that animal agriculture plays in driving climate change. You know, it, it, animal agriculture accounts for more greenhouse gas emissions than like the entire transportation sector. I mean, there are lots and lots of stats on this, on statistics on this. And yet animal agriculture has consistently not been a climate priority. Mm -hmm. It has not been a climate priority. And it's, it's really striking. And and the problem, a big part of the problem, I mean, there, this is a multifaceted problem, but a big part of the problem is, is carnism. You know, carnism basically makes people unaware of what's right in front of them and resistant to taking in any information that will help them recognize the problems inherent in animal agriculture. It's like, it's why so many veterinarians eat animals, you know, and support <laughs> animal agriculture. It's, you know, we've all been indoctrinated into the system until we really actively step out of it. And so... I wanted to make a video that was not just presenting more facts, like here's what's happening to the environment because of animal agriculture, because the facts don't, people, they're, they're being debated. You know, the facts don't work. The facts don't sell the ideology and the behavior. So I wanted to write a script, a video that would encourage people to like basically think about why why they question the facts in the first place. Like what is getting in the way psychologically of you not having the conversation that you would probably otherwise have about making animal agriculture a prior climate priority. So it's it's actually gotten quite a good response, um, a very interesting <laughs> response. I mean, you've seen it, so you know what it, yeah, it's, it's about. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a lot of people have, you know, some people in my life have written me personally. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, well, I don't want to say, maybe I shouldn't say anything. We can have viewers or listeners watch it and be surprised. <laughs> we do need to get it out further. We need it to like really, so, so any, you know, listeners who are interested, you can, I mean, you'll, maybe you'll send the link. People can come to carnism.org, but anybody who can help us push it out and in particular push it out to people in the climate movement, it would be great. Much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. But what other projects have you recently been involved with? 
Um, so at Beyond Carnism, my organization, um, we have just launched a new course through our Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy called the Science of Vegan Advocacy. Um, and yeah, so that's um, been very exciting. And um, we have some new uh, courses that we're also going to be putting online, either online courses. Um, we have in-person courses and trainings. We also have online courses and trainings. And I just um, put together uh, an, a workshop on infighting. And I've been doing a lot of work, a deep dive, as it were, um, because that's what I end up doing, going down many rabbit <laughs> holes. So I've done a massive deep dive into all things infighting uh -huh. and have sort of put together what I believe um, or what I, I've concluded from, from the, my analysis um, over a number of months of, you know, the key causes of infighting among vegans and, and ways to manage these and shift so that the movement becomes more, uh, uh, more, more connected, more sustainable and more impactful. So that I'm excited about. We also have a new training on a relational literacy that we're going to be um, putting out probably next year, um, early next year. And yeah, in our center for through our center for effective vegan advocacy, you know, we're really working to to build out our offerings for vegans who want to advocate more effectively and provide them with the tools and the resources to do that. Yeah, brilliant. And so I think you've written seven books total now. Is that right? Pretty much. So <laughs> again, another hard question for you. Do you have a favorite out of those seven books? And if our listeners only have time to read one of them, oh God. which one would you recommend? Oh God. Well, I mean, to be like a, a good book promotion person, I should say <laughs> that my new book that's coming out next year, How to End Injustice Everywhere, um, I'm very excited about that. But um, do I have a favorite? Why We Love Dogs was actually my second book and the one that was probably the biggest labor of love. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it depends on what people want. The, I mean, the books that I've written, they've really built on each other, you know, and I've, it's the, the new book, uh, How to End Injustice Everywhere, it's an expansion of my analysis of carnism to injustice, you know, more broadly. So I am very excited about that, too. Yeah, that's brilliant. I'm excited about that because I didn't know that you'd got a new book coming out. So I'm very much keen to read that one. I'm sure we'll have it in the Viva shop at some point as well. Thank you. But on that note, I just wanted again to say a big thank you for joining us today. That was really, really interesting. And if you want to just end on the point of where people can go to find out more information about your work and follow you. Oh, thank you. Um, Carnism.org. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Now, the hardest thing about that interview for me was getting the name of the book right. Do you know what it is? No, go on. <laughs> Why we love dogs, eat pigs, and wear cows. And it sounds like a bit of a tongue twister, and I swear I must have got it the wrong way around so many times. So before I actually kicked off the interview, whether I was just sat in my room going, Why we love dogs, eat pigs, wear cows. Why we love dogs, <laughs> eat pigs, wear cows. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, but she flipped the name herself, didn't she? She was yeah. saying that it hadn't sold, so so it's probably not the easiest title to remember. I didn't realise she was American. I don't know why. I, 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 when you read her, I kind of made assumptions she'd be like English or Swedish, <laughs> maybe. Swedish. Yeah, I don't know why Swedish, but then she started talking. I was like, oh, American, okay. Yeah, American. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous woman. Yeah. And I found it really interesting too, because I didn't know that she'd actually eaten this contaminated hamburger, and that's how oh. she got into veganism to start with. And I was just like... Oh, Oh, yeah, oh, that's awful. But it makes sense, doesn't it? Why on earth, so it's, you know, preparing something in the same space as something else, if you prepared some cabbage and some carrots and some tofu, you're fine. Mm. The fact that if you're preparing meat, fish or eggs near each other, you can catch salmonella, you can get ill. Yeah. That's not a good thing, <laughs> is yeah. it? Yeah. So obviously that kickstarted something quite major for her and a lot of the her work since then is around this whole cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. that we have and I find that really fascinating anyway because we do always say that we're a nation of animal lovers but we don't seem to make that connection or that like compassionate thought process when we actually sit down to dinner and we're eating animals it just is beyond <laughs> I, I know it's strange for us to think that because we've accepted it yeah but actually she made a really good point because I don't know about I mean I can be a bit high and mighty and I hope why can't you see this? Why don't you understand? But what she's saying is that it goes beyond the individual's response. That, you know, with carnism, it's 
a whole belief system mm -hmm. that is so encoded that we, they don't even, well, I mean, we've had to think about it at some point. She made the point of like saying coming out. Yeah. You, why would you have to do that? It's yeah. just because it's not the norm and it's so accepted what the norm is. Yeah. She calls it a third entity. A third a entity. Yeah, isn't yeah. that good? And yeah, she was yeah. like, it was funny because it was like couples counselling, but <laughs> always remember that actually you've got this extra layer of uh, beliefs and associations. Yeah. That's the kind of deadly partner in the relationship. Yeah. And it reminded me a lot about when I spoke to Heather Mills as well, because she made that joke about how she always dates non-vegans because it, it's her attempt to like make them into <laughs> vegans. But I mean, I, I'm dating a non-vegan, aren't yeah. I? And it's, it's fine. Even though they might come from a good place and yeah. they understand things, actually, there's a defense mechanism in people that goes up because it, you're questioning something that's just a, a truth. Yeah. A non-questionable truth to them. And they don't even know why they're getting yeah. angry and defensive over it. And that was the bit I found really yeah. interesting. And of course, it's not just like those personal relationships. It's like the relationships we have with anybody. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, my family are not vegan. And you just have to kind of be understanding that, you know, it's not necessarily because they're bad people or because they don't understand. It's because carnisms. And with yeah. carnisms to blame, basically, for everything. And I did really like when she started to kind of give these tips about forming better communication, mm -hmm. about pra like practicing integrity, having compassion and fairness, honoring dignity. And I, I think all activists should go into any kind of conversation with non-vegans about this. It's not, we're not right and they're wrong. That's not how we should look at this no. whole <laughs> debate or whole, you know, the world system. <laughs> Although, I mean, technically we are right, but, <laughs> but they're, not, know, like, they're not wrong. Stop. They're just not understanding, yeah. perhaps. It's unconditioning. Yeah. That's all it is, isn't it? It's unconditioning. And we've done it at some point, possibly yeah. not consciously, yeah. because, uh, you know, we just did it for our own reasons and put the, joined the dots. But actually, it's, that is a process of unconditioning, isn't yeah. it? And saying what might be right for many isn't right for me and... But a lot of people just haven't done that because mm. why would they unless they felt some, you know, something's happened for them to go, oh, that doesn't align with yeah. what I really believe in. Yeah. But then they don't believe in it because most people would say they love animals. Yeah. Mm. So I think ultimately to win the vegan war, <laughs> we've got to establish mutual understanding and not be aggressive in a lot of our kind of fight for it. I suppose in many ways, we, yeah, it's this, you know, respect and honouring each other and not be, being right and wrong. It, yeah, it's mutual understanding and that's how we can create a world that's a better place for everybody. Yeah, I, I thought it was a great interview. You did a really good job. She's so quick, mm. so quick. I was like, woof, okay, pay attention. Yeah. And you can't get, you know, she's thought about it and she's gone round and round and such a fascinating subject. Yeah. I mean, she was a great guest and just really, yeah, there was a lot to go away. I'm going to read up a bit more on everything she's kind of written about in carnism and learn a little bit more about it because she also touched very briefly on the violent side of mm. things as well, didn't she? About yeah. violence and non-violence. And mm. she just skimmed the surface of that in the interview. Yeah. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time, but that would be something I'd be interested in hearing a lot more of her thoughts on yeah. as well. Yeah, she's done a lot of really, really incredible work. So yeah, her books are available pretty much anywhere, also from the Viva Shop. So go to vivashop.org.uk. And yeah, thank you again so much for, to, for Melanie to join us on that episode because I thoroughly enjoyed mm, it and me obviously learned a lot from it as well. So for everybody else, thank you for listening. If you did enjoy the episode, don't forget to rate, review and subscribe and we'll see you next time. See you later. Bye.